global warming next to nuclear war is the greatest issue we face. Hi, my name's Sean Devine. I've worked in infrared physics for more than a decade and can handle the science of global warming reasonably well. But my expertise is now in system science. And I see that unless our narrative expands away from one of care of or blame, to one that takes the whole systems approach to global warming, we will make little progress. We must move beyond righteous activism to right action. The global warming narrative must move beyond targets to action. The dominant them, them and us narrative is failing us. Where the thems are those who are not listening to the us tribe whose job is to put the thems right. The narrative of blame trivializes the problem because it alienates those best able to take us forward. We must move beyond the narrative of righteous activism to one of right action. Before it's too late. Right action requires a holistic approach, a systems approach. To manage global warming, we must understand both our biosystem with its limits and our socioeconomic system within the biosystem. And without a whole systems approach, we'll get it terribly wrong. As systems gurus say, fiddling with a complex system in ignorance only makes it worse which is why we must go beyond this common blame narrative. First, no, do no harm must be the rule to manage any complex system, in particular, our bio-socio-economic system. Just as for the human body, this is a complex system where the first do no harm principle is captured in the Hippocratic Oath. And so too for our socio Bio, our bio socio economic system. Unless we see the system un underpinning human life as a whole, plausible simplistic narratives will frustrate progress, as these focus on targets, not on the problem itself. Many climate activists, here termed blame activists, fail to see the complexity of the whole system. They have a one dimensional narrative that avoids the issue like a train stuck on its track. The them and us narrative sees global warming as primarily a moral failure. It is seen as a justice problem where the thems, those who are responsible, need to be brought into line by the us people. This feel good 1D narrative rejects the big picture. It rejects truth by denying the complexity of the problem of global warming, and so fails to provide a concrete path forward. The narrative blames those who failed to address the issue in the past. It blames businesses with their focus on profit, and as seen with the COP26 activists, uh, those who went to the climate conference in November of 2021, blames governments who are, digging, who are dragging the chain. And they believe it's just another, uh, just a matter of importing targets or imposing targets to bring people into line. The blame narrative s stems from an ideological belief system that addressing global warming is purely a management issue. We're targets the means to get the great unwash governments and others to act. But the narrative fails to see the elephant in the room, recognized by economies that want to make a difference. And that is that with current technology, we cannot reach net zero emissions by 2050. And even with the best will in the world, progress towards these targets will be difficult. So the placard waving and shouting distances the guts of the economy that keeps us alive and well, and which actually wants leadership, not blame. There we have the blame merchants, trying to get the great unwashed to do as they're told. Sure, we can simply ban all fossil fuel use by 2028, but at the cost of massive global depopulation through starvation and war. 
those who have not wrestled with the world as it is find it easier to blame than to find solutions. Exhibiting a blind belief about the world that we live in. So we must understand the massively complex human life system that supports us if we are to be kept alive without destroying our planet. Science and scientists cannot tell us what to do. They may think they can, but at best they can only help us to understand how well we are doing. It is outside the orbit of science. It's not uncommon for some scientists to act as if they have done the hard part and that taking the action is the easy part. That is not so. This view indicates a dysfunctional relationship between uh, those who must bring about the change and the science community. The following realities confront the ignorant blame activists. Firstly, as I mentioned before, the capability to reach net zero by 2050 does not exist, and I'll deal with that later. And if you didn't know that it does not exist, then you shouldn't be in the game of activism. At best, current technologies may get us to 60%, but only with capable economic management. So any narrative that fails to acknowledge this point is morally bankrupt. Michael Moore's Planet of the Humans highlights the failure of the United States Green Movement to make a difference. The rants against the video, and it's mainly right, indicates the blame activists are in denial mode. Uh, see the link there. Another thing is it takes three years for a silicon solar collector to generate the energy of its manufacture. So if fossil fuels are to be replaced by uh, solar in, say, 30 years, 10% of that, three years' worth of fossil energy, is going to be needed to make these collectors. And that's a lot in the next 30 years. But there's more realities. As solar and wind power are intermittent, fossil or nuclear fuels are needed at the moment to make up the shortfall. And, and this will be needed unless massive energy storage systems become available. 20 square meters of solar collectors were required in 2021 to replace each person's share of fossil fuels. If the population increases by 2 billion by 2050, and that's quite possible, indeed likely, we will require an extra 40 billion square meters or 40,000 square kilometers of collectors. Where is this going to come from? It'll come from farmland or by destroying forests. For example, the land for renewable biodiesel in Europe is made from Indonesian palm oil, but it comes from burning the forest. And uh, burning the forest releases decades of stored carbon into the atmosphere. And biodiesel in the US made from uh, corn has similar problems. And we, in the uh, palm oil case, we shouldn't forget the poor orangutan whose habitat is being displaced. But there's more issues ignored by those who want the simple narrative. Norway, for example, is seen as an economy using electric vehicles. But these are mainly the second car of the family, and they're subsidized by North Sea gas. So they're not really renewable or running off renewable energy. And according to Amnesty International in 2019, the cobalt for lithium batteries comes from Congo mines using child labor. Our current battery technology for electric vehicles is inadequate to replace petrol vehicles. Even then, in many economies, fossil fuels are needed to generate the increasing electricity demands made by the electric vehicles. It's just fossil fuel use pretending to be electrical. So any 1D blame narrative that stops us working together must be rejected. In 2018, France had high unemployment, sluggish growth. President Macron imposed a diesel tax to reduce carbon uh, emissions. Sure, it makes sense. But the draft horses of economy, not the bureaucrats and the elite office workers, carried the burden. 
This led to the Yellow Vest Riot because the government imposed rather than engaged with the draft horses, those doing the heavy or carrying the heavy load in society. Now the riots reduced when Macron reversed the tax, but they carried on in, a, in a, a milder form until COVID hit France. So this failure to engage forced Macron to back down. So too for us if we fail to engage. So the simplistic approach to the complex life support system creates a dysfunctional relationship between the show ponies, the activists and others who prance about telling others what to do and the draft horses who will ultimately have to do the heavy work. And so we need a holistic narrative, a whole systems approach that moves beyond blame, class and fear. And here we see this as a class system emerging where the elite show ponies see themselves as superior to the draft horses who do the heavy work. So this talk is to try and help us to create a narrative, given the world as it is, that can replace the simplistic narrative that uh, we hear most of the time. Blame narratives that shape societal thinking. Three representative Pied Piper narratives are those that lead into a cave of despair. The first is the papal encyclical, Laudato Si. The second is the lobbying of the religious leaders in New Zealand, where well, that's my country. And finally, the activist frustration with the Glasgow Climate Conference in 2021. First, Laudato, Laudato Si, the encyclical of Pope Francis, and it focuses on care for our common home. The encyclical basically states that profit-seeking businesses are producing this useless consumer stuff that is destroying our global home. And that's true enough. But it avoids addressing how we feed those in the third world factories who are kept alive because they're producing this stuff for first world countries. The encyclical blames extreme consumerism and denies that population growth is relevant. But where is the land to feed the and the renewable energy to support an increase in population uh, from about 8 billion today to 10 billion by 2050? The encyclical calls for decisive action. But what action? It points the finger using phrases like ecological conversion, but commits to nothing. And that's the point, seeing the problem as primarily moral or spiritual. Yet, why haven't they committed to having solar collectors on all church buildings or eliminating fossil fuels in church vehicles by, say, 2030? No, someone else is expected to do the heavy work. And the forgotten Pope Gregory the Great. And he's their example. 1600 years ago, he actually showed decisive action. St. Gregory marshaled the church lands to feed Rome following several sackings and floods that destroyed the food supply. So forget the Pope's advisors who crafted this encyclical. They were concerned with theological issues not life and death and solving the problem. Yet the Catholic Church failed to tap in its own significant capability on the issue. It has enormous resources. And how could they ignore Dr. Mark Carney, who in 2015 was the UK Catholic of the Year? <coughs> Carney was the 2020 Wreath Lecturer and is now the UK advisor to COP26. And, as is discussed later, Carney provides an economic framework to transform society. Why not tap into him? Then we move on to the narrative of the so-called religious leaders of New Zealand. In October 2021, the religious leaders in New Zealand urged the government to present tougher greenhouse gas targets for the Glasgow conference. And you can see it there. These leaders, 
or their advisors, argued that as they stood for the marginalised, they were the ones to tell government what to do. But the statement sees global warming as a simple management problem, which it is not, and completely ignores how uh, a society is to meet these stricter targets. Particularly when at the moment, New Zealand is importing coal because of its increasing electrical needs. This is cloud cuckoo land statement. This is a cloud cuckoo land statement and leads me to apologize to my cousins of other faith who almost certainly were dragged into supporting those of these Christian activists. And as a member of the Anglican tribe, I attempt to persuade local leaders to broaden their narrative beyond finger pointing to one that engaged society as a whole. But I got the brush off, literally. Nevertheless, while many young Anglicans are attempting to live simpler lifestyles, their leaders act as if they are morally superior and who see no need to broaden the narrative. The finger pointing narrative is an embarrassment to Christians in the wider community. And then we come to the third example, COP26, the 2021 UN meeting in Glasgow on global warming. China and Russia, heavy greenhouse gas emissors, failed to attend because they saw it primarily as grandstanding. It's actually doing something, not talking about it, that matters. Yet China's leading the world in electric vehicle manufacture, and in a few years, these vehicles will dominate the global car market. The 30,000 activists who descended on Glasgow, hoping to present pressure the nations and the economies, saw it as a failure. They were not listened to. Quite simply, they were in cloud cuckoo land. They acted like show ponies, superior to the draft horses of the economy that will need to do the heavy work. There we are, telling others what to do. An underlying economic myth blinds many activists from seeing reality. The myth is that the economy, which is seen as the cause of the problem, can be controlled by right-thinking people like us and so frustrating any chance of real progress. So to the media, including the science media, they portray a crisis, increasing anxiety, but without focusing on what can be done. That's what we want to do now. now no more lecturing uh, and so on. To provide a basis for economic dialogue, and we do need a basis, I have posted a YouTube video devoid of equations and ideologies which asks how an economy works. And from that, you can see what needs to be done. There we have a picture of the economy. Some shouting to beat it because it's not doing well enough. And the other saying, build the wall higher. The targets are too easy. And then the poor economy has to feed 10 billion people uh, in less than 30 years. The narratives about targets, blame and control are failing. There is no free lunch in an economy. Someone must work harder, smarter, invest more, or innovate to reduce emissions. And no matter who is at fault, as yet, there is no clear path ahead. Blame activists fail to see how to reduce global warming without increasing global poverty or causing a world recession. Failing to see that the real need is to pull together and this can only be done by engaging with those who provide society's needs. Nicholas Stern brought economics into the climate narrative. Asked by the Blair government in the UK, Stern, now Baron Stern, articulated the way forward that made sense to the business community. To then it all seemed hopeless, but Stern in 2006 articulated the problem in insurance terms so that people could understand it. In essence, if we paid a premium of a few percent of GDP today to address global warming, we would avoid massive costs of maybe 20% of GDP in the future. This was a step in shifting the narrative from one of blame and despair to one of purpose and direction. 
Recently, Mark Carney, who I mentioned, proposed an economic strategy based on values, and this takes it one step further. Dr. Mark Carney, in the 220 Wreath Lectures, and in his book, Values, shows how to align government and private sector initiatives to address global warming. And the, his global his lecture on uh, global warming can be found in the link there, but he had several other lectures with, which are well worth following. Carney, having been governor of the Reserve Bank of Canada and then of the Bank of England, is now UK advisor to COP26. His holistic argument is that society can manage the economic system not by command and control, but by prioritizing its values. The principal value being to reach net zero for carbon emissions by 2050. Values here are not rules, but they're the principles we live by, what our priorities are. A government, for example, may claim to act for the people, but this is a lie when the government acts to remain in power. Its value is one of remaining in power. Carney notes that the capability to reach net zero by 2050 does not yet exist. While good management is necessary, management is not enough. We need innovation in fields of energy, energy storage, transport, food supply, and indeed the way we live. And we need to be prepared to, be, to sacrifice. And to do that, we must be a better informed population. The private sector must be part of the solution, a major part of the solution. But governments must find the right incentives for optimal action. By taxation, subsidies, creating a better transport infrastructure and food production. Any climate activist who cares must get their head around the real issues which Carney faces squarely and not hide behind the uh, veil of moral or righteousness. Critically, values must apply equally to the government. While the private sector tends to focus on profits, it will buy into other values within a social contract. However, government can be as bad, tending to focus on power, not on meeting the problem or dealing with the problem. Unless governments are held accountable, they will void the social contract and no one will play the game. An appalling example is the hypocrisy of the United States just prior to the November uh, Glasgow conference. Prior to the conference, the President Biden of the US, as part of his Build Back Better uh, program, met with the electric vehicle manufacturers in August of 2021. Biden extolled GM as leading the world uh, an electric vehicle manufacturer and announced subsidies for GM and Ford and so on. Tesla was not invited and got no subsidies. Yet GM, and this is true, only produced 26 electric vehicles in the last quarter of 2021 and had to buy back previous production because of battery fires. On the other hand, Tesla produced 303,000 uh, electric vehicles in the same time. The US government values are political, not societal. And that's not the values we want. All talk and no action. Whereas Elon Musk, the time person of the year in 2021 and the founder of Tesla, has real values, the values that we need, a vision for a sustainable planet. Why should the White House not acknowledge that Tesla leads the world? Perhaps Judgment Day will come in a few years as Chinese EVs with Tesla dominate the US car market and people will wonder what General Motors was. Real world perspectives need to be part of our DNA. Not show pony stuff that ignores reality and reflects a class system. Without holistic thinking and a well-informed population, division, chaos and disaster awaits us. Remember the yellow vest riots in France? Society did not have the chance to buy into it. Or the trucker rebellion over COVID when the great unwashed were ignored by governments. Societal buy-in is essential. 
not societal control. We won't get there with societal control. Truth and understanding, but these myths of control and management bring despair. We need to lock our arms together, so to speak, to cross the dangerous current of the river of life. But those who judge the past or the present, while themselves refusing to join with those seeking the way forward, are themselves now being judged. I'm going to continue this talk later. It's a preliminary talk, and the one that follows this uh, is dealing with how things are going in the real world and what we can do to provide a hope for the future. Thanks very much.